Hey, Dolphins, welcome to a special episode of AllDolphins.com. Well, actually, not AllDolphins.com, but All Dolphins Podcast. Um, we are joined today by Emery Hunt, who is the owner and creator, writer of Football Game Plan. He puts together the largest draft guide, 200 individual scouting reports for the 2024 draft class. 900, um, 900. No, what did I say? What did I say? Two, two, 200. 200. That's his running backs. <laughs> and actually, that's, that 200 is usually what most people put out. 200, 250, um, 900 scouting reports. Man, that's a lot of scouting reports. He's also a CBS an at, football analyst for CBS Sports HQ. Um, you can see him on CBS's programming. Uh, I brought Emery on primarily because I've been following him for a while. I, I love his take. I love his perspective um, on, on draft prospects. We were just chopping it up uh, about the 2020 draft class, and he has it documented, Emery. Tell us your quarterback ranking in the 2020 draft class. Number one was Joe Burrow. Number two was Jalen Hurts. I caught a lot of flack at the time for that. And number three was Tua Tagovailoa. I, I really like his anticipation, his pay placement, his accuracy, and I felt like he was someone that I would have taken uh, in round one. But I did have Burrow and Hurts ahead of Tua. See, it's quarterback accuracy. We, we we have this continuously long debate that uh, Pupar does thinks his accuracy is overblown, overrated. Oh, no, nah, you need that because it's it's it ties directly with his placement uh, because he because he has if if I can get the ball out quickly to where you have to where you can catch it and run, it negates my lack of arm strength. Because e even with the deep ball, folks don't feel 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 like you have to have strong on to throw a deep. But technically, no. the deep ball is a quick throw. It's like once the ball comes out, you, anticipation kills everything. Now, it's a nice to have the the, the strong arm because it helps minimize some mistakes. Or helps you mitigate some mistakes, um, but yeah, his and and I wasn't the biggest tour guy throughout his college career, but when I had to put him under the microscope and grade him for the prospect uh, guide, I was like, man, it's just hard to defend the accurate pass with great placement. And he was consistent with that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> look at look at Omar. It's funny because I'm gonna get accused of like Pupar smirking every or he's making faces when Emery's talking, and Omar's Omar's like. Yeah, 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 yeah. And listen, and that's what made me fall in love with him in the draft prospect. That that slant, man, that accurate slant, throwing it with a to a receiver in stride. All he's got to do is make one guy miss or break one tackle, and you could take that to the house. Everybody says he was a product of those receivers, and I would argue that that those receivers were were benefiting. What 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 what, what I said it. They were they were benefiting from Tua Tungavaloa's accuracy, timing, precision, ball placement. You, you better put some respect on his name, man. You, I, I can't, I can't. This gentleman here that I do this podcast with, it's it's an ongoing battle. But let, let's talk a little bit about. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Before we, we move on, just very quickly, Marie, so you'll know that the base that you're that you're dealing with here is just. I am one of those who will push back when, when, like nonstop praise is thrown at the guy because he has not put the team on his back like other quarterbacks have. Down the stretch, that's all. But he, I'm not not to say that he hasn't been a good quarterback in the NFL. He's been good the last two years, but he's there's still something missing. Anyway, go ahead, Omar. Uh, there is something missing, um, and I, it's called killer mentality. Be clutch. Um, so we're still waiting for that. But let's let's get into some of these drafts. Uh, let's get into 2024 draft because that's what we really brought you here. Um, view this as a conversation, as an introductory level conversation to everybody who just. Woke up, free agency's over, people stopped signing players, and now they're like, oh, man, um, what's this draft looking like? Um, how deep would you say the caliber of talent is in this draft? At what round do you think I'm going to stop getting starters? It's a fascinating question because, uh, you know, my perspective is completely different in how I approach it because I grade too many players. So I always feel like, you could find starters in the draft. I don't look at it as like, oh, this guy was picked in the seventh round. Like, we could just poo-poo that pick. Like, nah, you only get seven picks, right, essentially. Um, I want to find seven starters because we're in the NFL. We get to scrape off the top. I could find seven guys that can start out of 10,000, right? Um, so I view it that way. But I, to, to your question about the depth of the class, the elite parts, 
there's elite parts at certain positions like wide receiver, tackle. I feel like you can find some really good um, combo kind of guys at safety, guys that could kind of play free, strong, can double down in the slot and cover big receivers or bigger t- or athletic tight ends. So it, it's position specific, but generally from a 10,000 foot level, speaking on this class, it's a it's a fantastic class of receivers, maybe rivals 2014. I won't go as far and say it's 96, but 2014 um, and tackle. I feel like you can get some legitimate studs. So I will say this, like whoever takes the first receiver or first tackle, expect to, to see five go in succession. Right. Because that's how somebody's going to start the run, because that's how talented this group is at the top. Mm-hmm. What 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 about the blue chip prospects? And I give you here's a reason why I asked this question. The Dolphins have a top heavy roster, kind of, but their depth is a disaster. No young players, developmental young players, they and no cheap players because, you know, the draft is about getting cheap labor for four years. So there's nobody cheap on the roster that you want to develop for four years and then say, okay, I'm eventually going to pay him. So I think that this is a draft where you need quantity if you're Miami, not necessarily quality. Now, they sit at the 21st pick. um, And I think the best approach could be for this organization, unless there's an elite player there sitting, if the top 20 player is sitting there while you're on the board at 21, then I say, okay, go get it. But if top 20 player is not sitting there i think you should trade down and pick up more assets because you need more bodies how many blue chip prospects would you say is in this draft guys who you're certain they will be a pro bowler at one point in their career i'd say about a good 12 12 um, 12 so and when i say pro bowler i'm looking at i'm thinking in terms of the grades that i have in my guide guys that have 80 or better um and that's about, you know, usually 12 to 15. Let's put 12 to 15 if I'm thinking about it, like, correctly uh, without looking at it. So I would say 12 to 15. Um, but after that, to your point, and it's a great point you made about how you look at a draft class and how you look at a roster. And so, for instance, I'm not going to say, like, last year there were maybe five backs I personally would have felt comfortable with taking in round one. This year, there's no backs that I would feel comfortable taking in round one. However, there is backs that I would, wouldn't would mind taking to be starters, if that makes sense. So you're looking at, okay, this is a great class to improve our QB2, our RB2, RB3, maybe our tight end depth, our safety depth. Maybe we could find some good depth at center. So it's like this is that type of draft where you do go in and say, we can get some very good rotational talent on our roster and maybe some guys outside of that rotation that we can then stash and develop that can end up being part of the rotation and uh, kind of be a starter down the line. Kind of like I had a high grade on Robert Jones, who was an undrafted free agent for the Dolphins in 21. And now you look at him now, technically he's penciled in right now as a starter. So that was someone they took out of Middle Tennessee, groomed him, developed him, and now he's a starter. And I do feel like the draft every year you can find guys like that um, that can be outside of the draft or even on day three, late day yeah. three, you can bring in and kind of work within that system. And you ha- you have a really good because the league is made up of 90 percent good rotational talent. There's only 10 percent stars. Right. So the majority of your league is going to be the guys that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. My question would be and it's a different way of framing the question that Omar asked, which is something I. I brought up myself quite a bit. If the Dolphins, the Dolphins right now have pick in the first round, pick in the second round, nothing until the fifth round. Mm. So to me, if they could swing a deal, trade down from 21 to say, I don't know, 29 or 30, get a, like an extra third round pick or something like that. Is there a major drop off in terms of the the number of quality prospects at 21 that there would be at 29? Not at all. Not, not absolutely not. Um, and, and the, the, the reason why is because, you know, everybody has different needs. So you, you kind of figure, okay, well, this, this need, this team needs really at the top. You look at these three teams need quarterbacks that kind of pushes people down 
to even more so. So now if you're pick 21, you kind of push talent down to pick 24. So now you feel comfortable. Okay, we can slide back 24. Let's say you feel like the Dolphins are stacked at receiver. Well, there's probably five elite, elite receivers. So let's say two go. Now that pushes down to now you're still within range. So you kind of give yourself an idea of, okay, how far can we move back to get some of these blue chip type talents uh, late in the first round by picking up other back in uh, late day two, early day three, or just day three in general picks. Because, and it's a great point, when you think about the Rams, they did without first round picks for a while. Right? I think they were still in St. Louis when the last time they had a first round pick, right? Um, so That can't now, be true. Hold on, wait a minute. That, 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 that's true? That might be true. I think the last first round pick when they just moved Aaron to Donald Anaheim. Was- and they still had the white helmets. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, so it may be true, right? So, and, and golf was the last first round pick, I believe, right? So that was 2016. 2016. Um, so that goes to show you, right? And but what they would been able to do is nail those back end roster guys and undrafted rookie free agents. So if you trust your scouting department, you want those picks because to Omar's point about the cheap labor. You can't get cheaper than day three and undrafted. You basically playing these these dudes in in you know housing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like so you, you get you get these guys essentially for yeah. free. So you want a, I, if I was a GM, I would want a bunch of day three picks because I know I could find good rotational, inexpensive day three. So you want day three picks? You don't even want day two picks? I want day two picks, but I'm saying like if if. I want those like if you, you said they have no third round like you need third round picks, definitely need that. Um, so yeah, trading yeah, back in the first will help yeah. you acquire some third round picks, some you know uh, some fourth round picks. But uh, yeah, day three, four through seven, give me a bunch of those because I know I don't want a chance uh, a player that I have my eye on getting to choose his own spot. So if I have a seventh round pick, I'm drafting him to eliminate that. Oh, you know what? That's a good strategy because I think it's very easy to get a seventh round pick in a, in a draft. Uh, you you can trade a seventh round pick for a future seventh round pick in two thousand twenty eight. They don't care. They're they're basically some teams are just throwing them away. Right. Um, it, but I I like at what point do you get uncomfortable? Give me a number where you're getting uncomfortable. I know you do nine hundred draft pro, draft 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 grades um, with football game plan. Which tell people where they can find it at footballgameplan.com slash 2024 draft guide. At what number are you get? what number around are you getting uncomfortable in regards to starters or guys who can become starters in year two? Oh, after the, after the third round. So day three is when you start thinking of developmental starters. So rounds one, two, and three, yeah. I think in terms of these guys, I, I expect to come in and either start first round or be heavily in the rotation to where they're seen as starters rounds two and three. Okay. Um, let's get into some of the prospects. Oh, you, you want po- go ahead. Po- okay. So Omar and I both agree on this. Shocking. We agree on something uh, that ideally the Dolphins first round pick is a college tackle who plays guard, who can play guard for a year or two and then replace her on Armstead when he retires. Who would fit that bill and be available, maybe be available around the pick 21? Well, I know a lot of people are talking about the offensive tackle Fuaga out of Oregon State being one of those guys. Um, You know, Barton of Duke can be one of those guys. He's played tackle at Duke at a high level in the ACC. He could also play inside as a guard. He's cross-trained a little bit, so he may be there for, for the taking. Um, I like the tackle out of Yale, Kieran Amagaji, uh, 6'5", 328. Now, he's he's a tackle-only guy, um, but, you know, to secure that that talent, you kind of want you kind of want him, right? And so um, that's that's where I would think in terms of, okay, these are guys that can kind of give you that little bit of a crossover um, that have at least two guys, you know, have played tackle that can also play guard. Um and and one that's a tackle only, but you know, coming from uh FCS program, you have the little bit of luxury of of training him how you want him to be. And even though I view him as a tackle only, there's yeah. no downside in, t- in helping him, you know, cross train because he's gonna have to make that jump anyway. 
um, from the FCS level, Ivy League level to the NFL level. So you have the luxury of being able to groom him how you want to. Now, sticking with the offensive line, since Poo prematurely got us into the trenches and he knows I'm obsessed with them. Um, All right, Steal your thunder, Omar. I apologize. No, I was actually going quarterback and then working my way into what people yeah. thought was boring. But you know, since you you uh, you, I, since you did premature offensive line conversation, uh, let me continue to go here. Dolphins want an athletic offensive lineman. They want a guy who can get to that second level and mow somebody down. I need three names. You could take take your position. Give me that athlete playing offensive line well there there's a couple um you yeah, know give them to me there's there uh, i'm a big fan of the athleticism and the talent on field he's my number one guard in Javion cohen of miami i feel like cohen is fantastic and and here's the unique thing about cohen cohen is athletic he's strong he's able to get movement up front and and but on the move my number two guard, Cooper BB out of Kansas State, moves better than him in terms of getting out and around and going connect on, on defenders out on the perimeter. He's accurate when, whenever he's approaching and seeking a target. He's able to connect and really spring a, a long run. He's not as strong as Cohen and not as athletic, but he makes contact more consistently on a move and gets out on the move better. So both of those guys are really good guards. Um, I'm a big Tanner Bordellini guy at center. I feel like he's a really in, this, in certain positions um, and programs is sight unseen for me. Like mm-hmm. you say, hey, we're drafted a K State offensive lineman. I'm so I don't even have to watch him play. I know he's good. A Utah defensive player, sold. I don't have to watch him play. Right, sight unseen. Um, and so that's how I feel about uh, you know Bordelina at Wisconsin. And, you know, being up front, being a center, being able to do what he needs to do. And the reason why I, I emphasize and I mention, if you notice, guards and centers first. Because yeah, if you have any quarterback worth his salt, he'll step up in the pocket when he gets outside pressure. You can't step up if your guard's in the guard play is garbage. So to me, that's the most important part. Big tackle propaganda has you know made people believe the tackles are where you need to be. Like, no, man, your guard center guard has to be excellent because that's where offense happens. So and, and Miami's guard center guard, guard was trash last year. And, and that's where the run game happens. That's where protection happens. You disagree, um, Pupard? I saw that face. And if and here's the thing: if you are, um, if you're strong down your battery, the closer you are to the football is where you need to be strongest. That's center, quarterback, running back, D tackle, linebacker, safety. If you are strong right down the middle, everything else is going to take care of itself. Um, so I feel like this is where the Dolphins have to really be uh, locked in. But tackles, we talked about. You know, Fuaga. We talked about um, Amagaji. It, Futano, I, I, I ain't even want to mention because he's gonna be gone by then. You know what I'm saying? And so he's my number one tackle. Then Alt is my number two. Expect those guys to be gone before we even get out of the top ten. Uh, so I ain't even want to bring those guys up, but they're really good players as no, well. No, no, uh, Laramie Tunsil character fallers. <laughs> Somebody could always, you know what, man? If if the Dolphins are savvy enough. I mean, you throw you throw a couple of dead bodies on somebody. Like, man, look at this guy, oh, man. Damn, they have him fall. You know what I'm saying? Like, you throw some. Uh, Throw some ketchup on on and people on. people actually think teams don't do that. They yeah, absolutely, teams teams do, that. absolutely do that. Like, like man, I heard he robbed that bank in LA. And so next thing you know, boom, here he is at sitting at pick 21. I, right? I remember, I remember, guys are sinister. Why don't we just why don't we just leave it as a bong video? You guys are talking about <laughs> no, I remember so many prospects. I used to get calls on so many prospects about players. One uh, uh, offensive lineman, he ran a whorehouse. I was like, what are y'all talking about? Like this man, his, it, you know, his daddy was a pimp. He ran a whorehouse. And I can't remember uh, T- Tavares Gooden. There was some rumor out there about him, like being, being like a, a, a street thug. And I'm like, man, he just got that look. He, 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 this is a corporate kid that wants to look like he's a street kid. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy how they do that. They team to actually do that. Teams actually will put stuff out there. And then other teams will be like, have you heard about this? Back, back you know. Yep. But um, l- let me ask you a little bit about the center. Because even though the Dolphins signed Brewer, um, I think that there's a possibility that a guy, Jackson Powers Johnson, 
who a lot of Dolphin fans t- developed an unhealthy obsession with before they signed Brewer. I think there's a possibility he could be there at 21. Look, look, look at this guy. See, see. Come on, there we go. Uh, um, he was awesome at the combine. His interview. I want him on the team just for that. Great reason to draft the guy. Uh, he's a great talker. How how would you assess him and evaluate him as a player? You know, he's my number five center. Um, five, five, and and, and five. Damn. And people get caught up on a, the the ranking and not the grade itself because there's always a there's always like you know bunched up. So border, I'm looking at my draft guy now. Border leaning right now has a grade of eighty, and so the next grade is seventy six. So you got three guys at seventy six, right? So you kind of they're kind of one and the same for me, right? Is this about certain? They maybe do one thing different than the next one, so you kind of you know move this guy up even though they have the same overall grade. So it's not as bad as people like, oh, use your fifth. Yeah, but you got to. I need mean, I mean names to these five centers. Cedric Van Pryan is ahead of him. Also, Byron, uh, Brian Hudson out of Louisville. Big fan of his athleticism. Charles Turner is my number two uh, center. And I think Charles Turner is supremely athletic. We watched him at the Senior Bowl when they were just, uh, it was a com- competitive drill between the O line and the D line. And they were running routes against one another. Turner was out there like he was a tight end. I'm like, man, this dude actually got great routes. And on the defensive side, uh, Brandon Fisk of uh, Florida State was running like he was Gronkowski. I'm like, why is he not getting the football? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So this is, I love the athleticism of the linemen, right? And, and again, Oregon falls into that category of offensive linemen sight unseen in terms of they're good, they're rock solid. So, yeah, he's good. He's a bigger guy. You know, he's thicker. He's about 330. So I can understand why folks would like him. But that's when I come into the draft process, I'm introducing a lot of names. So people get married to these mock draft things yeah. and they kind of they hear the same name 30 times. So it becomes like self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you say something outside, of that, it's like, yo, who the hell is this dude? Then he ends up going higher. and he's like, Oh, OK, well, he was actually pretty good. But Johnson is good. I want people to think that I don't, I don't like um, him as a player because he's he's got good functional strength. Um, he's able to, to re- win with both strength and power. It's two different things. Yeah. Um, and he also gets a lot of movement in the run game. And you look at where a lot of their success happened. You talk about Bucky Irvin as a running back. A lot of his big plays came right down Main Street. Uh, and the reason why that's able to happen is because Jackson Powers Johnson was out there vacating space. The only thing I had um, questions about his hand placement can be a little bit inconsistent. So they can get outside the framework. So it may end up right angle could be a hold you know what i'm saying so just consistency in terms of your hand placement keeping them inside is the area of improvement i have for him but in terms of like what he's able to do yeah versus the run you're not going to bull rush him so he can handle he can sit down anchor and, and really get things going and, and pass pro it's a really good center now uh, well hold on hold on. my turn my turn my turn my turn um so there's a certain college football analyst who has mocked not once but twice uh, and this is something that Omar and I don't believe will happen for a millisecond, that <laughs> being Michael Penix Jr. to the Dolphins at 21. But still curious on your thoughts on Penix as, as a prospect and what kind of NFL quarterback he could become. This is tough because obviously I like Tua. And I feel like taking a quarterback there would be just a luxury. You know, and, and now you put undue pressure on the roster. You put undue pressure on the quarterback room. And the quarterback is one of the more unique positions on the football field because only one could play. And so it's not like Tua is in his mid-30s and you're kind of preparing for the future. I mean, hell, him and uh him and Michael Penix, same probably the same age, right? But you know, the fact that Penix is left-handed, I feel like, and I like Penix. Penix is someone I feel like is is a starter, and and you know, and I would take him if I needed a quarterback. If I was Atlanta, I wouldn't have paid you know, $3 billion to go get Kirk Cousins. I was just drafted Penix. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but him for the Dolphins just doesn't make sense for me. No, um, but that wasn't my question because Omar and I, we, we're not seeing that either. My my question was, what's your scouting report on him and what kind of an NFL quarterback do you think he'll become? He, and it's, and, and it's him and Bo Nix are in the same bucket because there are two different evaluations in terms of they've had two separate careers. If you looked at when I looked at Penix at Indiana, I didn't see. I thought he was streaky. It's a flat line thrower. The passes came out just all fastballs. There was no touch. He goes to Washington, 
and he develops touch on his deep ball. So now the ball, the accuracy improves in that regard. The placement improves in that regard. He still tends to be a flat line thrower. So you're going to see a lot of tip passes at the line of scrimmage uh, because of that. And um, obviously versus pressure, you want to see him be able to not only see it, but also get rid of it quickly. So I do feel like we'll see Are you him. Are saying he's a slow processor? Not a slow processor. I'm just saying like when you combine that with the footwork, his footwork to me is where it, it, it needs to clean up. Because if you're not set, you may see it and get ready, but you're not ready to throw it. You know what I'm saying? And so your footwork got to be where it needs to be. Uh, there's no doubt that he could see it and throw it and rip it because that's how you get the anticipation on the deep ball um, and, and the placement where it needs to be. So I think I, he would be someone – there's only two quarterbacks I felt comfortable with taking in the first round, uh, and that's Ooh, Jake two. Daniels and Caleb Williams. And everyone else I feel like are second-round picks or li- maybe late first, second round, if you want to take it. Because I feel like quarterbacks get pushed up unnecessarily. Yeah, absolutely. You know so you have their grades as really second round grades. Yeah, second round grades. Like, okay, yeah, and, and second round is a starter to me, where, hey, okay, we get a guy in the second round, he can start, and it, we could be fine. Because I feel like we, as a, as, a org, as a media group, have to start preaching to the fans that the quarterback is not the end-all, be-all. They're a piece of the puzzle. Because you want a quarterback proof your roster. Tell you have yeah, done that. You tell know the saying? Falcons that though last year. That that's the thing though. Um, you, he, you, have have, you have to have a certain level of 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 ability at the at the position. It may not be the end all be all, but you can't be like like a, you like, can't be Kirk Cousins or Derek Carr. You could be Tua and be fine. You could be Brock Purdy. But you're not taking Brock Purdy in the top wait five. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You just named two. Above average, but not elite quarterbacks in Kirk Cousins and Derek Carr. They are above average in terms of the uh, the pay window and also the box score. Here's how Kirk Cousins has everybody fooled. When you look at the box score, it'll say 29 to 35, 350 yards, four touchdowns and a pick. You're like, man, it, he, he played great. But what they don't show you in the box score is that pick came in at a crucial part in the game. The three fumbles he had that killed game – potential scoring drives and the ill-advised sacks he took that helped kill drives as well. And they lose by 10 points. Okay. That's fair. And that's too shit. What, what about Derek Carr, who is like leader in the NFL in fourth quarter comebacks? Now, he's why, just- why are you down so much? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, why are you down so much? Um, but, and I, and I will say this about Carr, honestly, and, and here's, I, and this is a full caveat too, about both of these guys. Your quarterback should not be worse than Cousins and Carr. I feel like they epitomize what I think yeah. an NFL average quarterback should be. Absolutely. You should be able to get uh, everyone outside of the elite quarterbacks. Your quarterback should at least play like Cousins and Carr. That's that should be NFL standard for. If, if you and if you don't, you need a new quarterback. Bingo, because those guys will at least get you to eight and nine or nine and eight. That's and that's what you want. Right, you want to be in the in the conversation. Those guys are not terrible. They are what I consider NFL average, which is good. Um, but with Derek Carr, I just feel like ever since that leg injury, he hadn't been the same. And, and I think that really has shell shocked him. Kind of like how Carson Palmer was after the knee injury. Like he was a little bit gun shy. Didn't he? Didn't look the same. He was playing well, but he wasn't playing like Carson Palmer. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like Derek Carr was. You know, he led the team to the playoffs, and it looked like he was really – he looked like Fresno State Derek Carr, and then he got hurt. Then he became gun shy. Then he started to concede sacks, and it's like – you know, it was like, man, what's going on? He don't look the same. So I feel like that's that's what I say about Carr, but I feel like both of those guys are what I consider NFL average, which should be the standard. Let, let, let me – I, I want to move off from the quarterback, but you said something previously that I've heard from people – Inside the league and analysts that I respect, you said Jalen Daniels and then Caleb Williams. Usually people list them in the order that they have them ranked. Where (laughs) how uh, did you just foreshadow how you have them ranked? No, no, no. Caleb I have first and Jaden I have uh second. Caleb, I have a 90 grade on. I I rarely give out 90, so he has the, the highest grade of anybody in this draft class. Um, Jaden, I have an 84 grade, so I feel like he's right there. He has the same grade I gave Justin Fields, who was my number two quarterback behind um, uh, Trevor Lawrence, who I had a 90 grade to. Um, 
And so I do feel like Jaden Daniels gets people bring up LSU, but don't talk about ASU. ASU is where he really stood out. He was a true freshman beating Justin Herbert um, in top five Oregon in the, in, out there in, in Tempe. So he was a, a very good quarterback from start. The team just got in a situation, got worse. Then he goes to LSU. We saw last year, he and people say, well, he, he had, he's a one year wonder. Like, wait a minute. LSU was in the SEC championship game with one of the worst defenses in college football history. Like that's all on the quarterback and offense scoring points. And then this year they uh, still had the same bad defense, but he was still out there doing what he had to do to keep those guys in the game. So when you have that level of ice water in your veins, when, when you know you got to produce in yeah. order for your team to have a shot, that's not gonna, the type of guy I want playing quarterback for. Now tell me why Caleb Williams is your is a 90 rated player because i i've looked at it i've watched college games i'm like i don't see andrew luck and i know maybe that's an unfair standard but or i don't see joe burrow but why do you have him rated so high because i think as a prospect he's better than both um but here's why this is what i saw with caleb you know you talk about someone going in certain situations um and to come into that Red River rivalry where we first saw him, Spencer Rattler was playing at an all-time high. This dude comes in off the bench, and in a clutch situation in a rivalry game, boom, takes off for like 70 yards for a touchdown, brings them back and helps them win that game, right? And it's like, wow, this dude really came out of nowhere. Then he was able to carry that out throughout the rest of the year, transfers to USC. And what I like about him is that you guys know this. You guys watch a lot of football. You cover football. You know that. Just because you are in the route doesn't mean you're in the progression. So you may have four receivers out there in, in a pattern. Two of them are running for the love of the game routes, right? They're just trying to pull coverage away, while the other two are really the focus. But with Caleb Williams, everybody is is in play. And that when you have the ability to have a full uh, field read as a quarterback and have the arm strength and accuracy and placement to get it there, like a Patrick Mahomes, that's where the Patrick Mahomes comp kind of makes sense. Where Mahomes is the same way, as long as you get open, no matter how long the play ends up being, because he's scrambling around, he's gonna find you and get it to you accurately. And on top of that, he could take off and run for fifty yards or sixty yards. Like, geez, like that's that's the kind of guy that changes the math on offense and changes the game because you can trust him out there as a receiver. You're like, okay, cool. I know if I could just get open, he's gonna find me. Now, yes. Every play can't be 20 seconds long. He has to really understand when to let a dead play die, right? He does put the ball on the ground, you know, with the with the fumbles. But, man, you love the fact that he's competitive, he's athletic, he has a legit arm, um, and has a deep ball accuracy and placement to really expand the defensive coverage and makes it hell on, on wheels to, to, to defend. Uh, I have to ask you the obligatory question here. That's not about a 2024 prospect, but about a 2023 prospect. And tell me what your scouting report report was last year on Cam Smith and why should Dolphin fans have any uh, expectations, optimism that he'll plan pan out eventually after his washout rookie season? I like Cam Smith. I, I can't remember the exact grade I had on him uh, off, off top, but I know I had a, a pretty solid. I actually had a higher grade on his teammate, um, Darius Rush, who's now with the Steelers. Who had got drafted by the Colts, but and had a pick six in the preseason, but then got cut by the Colts and got quickly picked up by by Pittsburgh, right? So I thought Rush was a little bit better because Rush had a little bit more upside. Smith to me is a good press corner. Uh, he can beat you up at the line of scrimmage. He's very physical, and, and sometimes corners need that adjustment to the NFL. And I'm not making a uh, you know I'm not I'm not putting the you know the statement on the SEC. But it's different when you get a corner coming out of the Pac-12 or coming out of the Big 12 as opposed to a corner coming out of the SEC. Like you is going to you're going to need a little bit of adjustment, you know, because the passing games are not where you what you see in the ACC or Big 12 or Pac-12 is a little bit different in the SEC. Only certain teams can throw the ball like that to where you're getting tested. Um, and so for him, it may take longer. It may took it took a season. So I, I do expect the best of him because South Carolina's strength last year was their secondary on defense um and he was one of the good ones man and so he, he's got the length he's got the the size he's got the requisite skill 
uh, combining with the size and length, and that's going to help him uh, be better this year than what we saw from him as a rookie. Now, we we have obviously the Dolphins had a, a, a loss in free agency, not just one, but Christian Wilkins was signed a massive deal with the um, Las Vegas Raiders, and the Dolphins signed a lot of bodies, <laughs> but not necessarily any players. Uh, it's funny because you mentioned Brandon Fisk, and I, I'm obsessed with him because I know he's not going to be an early draft pick, but he moves around very well. Um, how would you replace Christian Wilkins if you were Miami? That that is a tall ass, number one. But it's not just replacing him; it's also replacing uh, Raquan Davis too, who's a massive size guy, kind of help a guy like Wilkins, right? But Wilkins was so versatile and so disruptive. There's one guy in his class that I think is is that disruptive. Um, that now you starting to see, maybe people are starting to talk about him now, but uh, Brandon Dorless of Oregon, okay, fantastic. You know, I grade him as my number one five tech, so he's kind of in that cross where he can be a D tackle, can be a five technique defensive end in the three four front, but he's versatile enough to where he can rush over the guard, over the tackle, um, and he's he's super disruptive. You watch him at Oregon, you watch how disruptive he was in the backfield, and yeah, he's built like a catcher. He has a weird, weird body where he's like short torso, long legs, kind of small body. But he's got a, he got a, you know, kind of he's built like a catcher. You know what I'm saying? But he's good, and I feel like he is someone that um, if Miami Miami has good edge presence, uh, but they just got to stay healthy. So you really want to improve those three dudes up front. I think Dorless is one. Darius Robinson of Missouri, I feel like is a better five technique as opposed to a seven as a as an you know defensive end guy. But he's someone that can win with length. He could walk guys back into the to the pocket, so he's going to command a, a, you know some some attention, which frees up Chubb, which frees up Phillips to get out there and get after. It. If you're looking for another hired weapon to come off the edge, um, I know they signed Shaq Barrett. This guy's in the same mold of uh, uh, mold of Shaq Barrett. Um, matter of fact, came from the same program as Shaq Barrett and Mo Kamara out of Colorado State. Like he's six one, about two forty eight, two fifty. But I felt like when I was grading this film that, you know, either my film is broken or this dude is literally, literally that fast off the ball. Because it felt like within the snap, he was already at the ear hole of the tackle, dipping underneath him and getting around the corner and getting in the backfield. So you could, th this is a good class for guys that are versatile, guys that are hired assassins. Hey, your sole job is to rush the passer and guys that can play that base defensive end down in, down out. Who's that player you were saying? The, the, the ear hole edge guy? Mo Kamara out of uh, Colorado State. Mo like, is he related to Alvin? <laughs> nah, it's Muhammad Kamara. Nah, I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know if he's probably not. It's probably not. He's not even from. Uh, I don't think he's from the same uh, spot. But we're all family under God's eye, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned. Uh, I, 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 I want to wrap it up with you, um, but you mentioned the safety class, and I. I I, I and I remember you tweeted something earlier last week, and I'm I think people are sleeping on this safety class, and I think that might be part of the reason why you're seeing a ridiculous stack of safeties unemployed in free agency right now. Um, give me some sleepers. Give me some. Give me some guys to look at in the safety class. And, and when I grade the safeties, I, you know I grade them by free safety, strong safety, and what I like to call combo safety. So oh, combo really? safety is a little bit of both guys that, you know, can match up against big receivers, athletic tight ends that, but also give you a good run defense presence. You know what I'm saying? So Jalen Phillips is my number one, Jalen Simpson, I'm sorry, is my number one free safety out of Auburn. I just think he is, he was by far the best in terms of free safety, how you expect those guys to play. And I think when people look at Sean Preston of Mississippi state, they'll be impressed too. Um, Cause I talked about his teammate, Marcus Banks, who can play corner or safety. So he would fall in that combo safety. Uh, type pattern but also as a slot corner but Preston to me was also very good um and he was another one that 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 can play anywhere in the secondary but he has good patience good discipline I, I'm shocked that no one is talking about the Jim Thorpe award who went and trade Taylor out of Air Force it, I, maybe because he went to Air Force and people don't know if if you know because it changes I feel like it changes every year where if you draft them they could play but if but but all they have to serve their two so we never really understand what year it is and what when they could play or not play. But the dude won a Jim Thorpe Award. Like he's that means the best defensive back in the country. 
And when you grade his film, the dude has elite level instincts, good football awareness, um, and also can make plays on the ball both in the run game and also as as a uh, you know in in um, in pass cover. So he definitely can turn the ball over. So there's a bunch of those type of guys in the in the draft. If you're looking for one of them downhill thumpers, um, Cole Bishop out of Utah, sight unseen, strong safety. Uh, Malik Mustafa out of Wake Forest. I, you rarely see someone get from the deep third into the backfield, like within the blink of an eye. Like he is explosive downhill, but he's more of like your thumper uh, and what he brings to the table. I, I know I tweeted about Sanusi Kane of Purdue, another matchup type of safety, a little twitch to him that can cover, but also gives you good run defense presence. So this is, I think this is an underrated safety class. I think what happens when people uh, that are do this in the media side of things, they'll look at, the safeties, if they don't see five air reads, say, oh, this safety class is trash. Like, no, it's not, man. This dudes get out, can play. Um, and we, we'll see that manifest itself out there on the field. How, how do you feel about Cam Kitchens from Miami? I like him. I like Cam Kitchens. And I'll tell you right now, Kitchens is someone um, that can – he he's not as fast, um, but he, he can match up. And it's a matchup league. And as long as – you see him as a matchup safety? You don't see him as a traditional free safety? Well, when I say matchup, I'm talking about matchup in terms of like, okay, this team wants to get the backs out involved or wants to get the the the, the tight end out involved. Let's say if the Dolphins is playing Detroit, you want someone like Kitchens um, as a safety because I feel like he could match up. Or if you're playing someone that, let's say like Baltimore, you know, you want someone like that that can match up in terms of like, okay, he could be our, our alley guy. He could, this week he's our alley guy, our, our alley guy that can match up on their their outlets, their tight ends. He can kind of press the issue with Lamar a little bit um, in terms of blitzing. So that's what I mean when I when I turn by matchup. That's right, definitely. Um, Poop, you got anything else? Nope. Other than nothing. Other than a big thank you to Emery for joining us and giving us some of his time. Uh, on that note, I, I do a thing every year, Emery, my man crush list, guys that I absolutely would bang the table for. In, in the draft class, yes. I, need, I need five names, guys. You putting your name on, they, and I don't want them all first rounders now. Oh, you weren't getting that anyway. Like, yeah. I, I'm, I go deep in the draft, so you weren't getting that. I was, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you do some homework. Yes, uh, give me some uh, homework. Give you some homework. Okay, cool. Number one, Jaden Sheridan, Mammoth. I called a lot. Of, I called probably eleven of his games over the last three years, and. It, Thank God for Keaton Mitchell last season, who was my number four running back. Thank God for him because it makes people now look at Jaden Sherton, who came in at about 5'7", about 190. But this dude legit can fly. Every time, every game I called, he he I, he had at least one 60-plus yard run. There were certain games where 5'7", 190, not going to hold up in the NFL, though. You got to catch him first. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, You're not getting in the ball Five times a game either you can't hit what you can't catch you can't hurt what you can't touch so that's someone that's just explosive like he mitchell like you got to catch him first um mm -hmm. so and, and he let he was toting that rock 20 times a game for mama and to you know to you guys point he won't have to do that in the league but he's a fantastic running back explosive talent and now with the change in the kickoff rules could definitely help help you out right there uh as as a special teamer um number two Javion Morton, cornerback, Morgan State. Every game I called at Morgan State over the last three years, and this is what he has as great, um, and the great players have this. It's a sense of timing, of when to make the play. Like, you ever watch a game, he's like, man, he need a big play here. Boom. Here's a dude that makes the play, and it's always certain guys, right? He is one, he's 5'8", about 180. Um, slot corner, well, you know, when you talk about someone that can really find the football consistently, like don't try to don't be late trying to throw an out route. That ball is going back the other way. You know what I'm saying? Don't try to think, oh, this dude is five eight. We gonna play up top. He is skying up top and he's taking the ball away from you. He's got elite ball skills, um, and he was fantastic at Morgan State. So that's number two. Number three, let's go to Pennsylvania. Slippery Rock wide receiver Kyle Sheets, six two. 222 can legit fly in terms of like he wins off the line of scrimmage. He's able to stack the defensive backs and continue to create that separation going downfield. And it, it was, I remember um, this was in casual watching. I had a game 
the call later that that eve that afternoon or that evening and it was his first game back from injury when i say the first play they went up top and he took off he, he scored a touchdown in his first game back from injury right so and they knew he was getting the ball he's another one of these big time wide receivers had a he had a great college gridiron showcase and also ran high four four low four five at his pro day temples pro day just a few weeks ago staying at receiver i'll get and i won't give you i, I gotta give you a little bit more because there's there's a there's a stack here these receivers from division three are just insane cole burgess uh out of Cortland. now Cortland and north central played the division three national championship game both have elite wide receivers cole burgess was one of them for Cortland, um who ran four four forty had a 1.43 yard 10 yard split which is an nfl record at the combine explosive as all get out and and you talk about someone that would fit in perfectly with miami and you talk about speed this dude has it on the how other big? side how big on other, how big he's like 5 11 by 190 so okay. you know and you look at the other guy not as fast but plays faster um for north central and i wrote about him in 2022 uh, D'Angelo Hardy, he in st- stylistically, just from a style perspective, yeah. reminded me a lot of Andre Reed, supreme catch and run guy, just fluid, like he almost like Tyler Boyd, you know, we catch the ball in the stride, just kind of like finds yards and, and is he also returns kickoffs. Uh, he's at six feet, one ninety five. Both of these, so Burgess to have a fifty yard touchdown play. North Central got back out there. There goes Hardy with a 70-yard touchdown play. Uh, so it was like they were going – they both had like over 200 yards receiving in that championship game, but both are excellent receivers. Um, John Giles, West Florida, 6'2", 202, had a really good college gridiron showcase. He's a supreme athlete. Talk about leaping ability, he has it. His game against FAMU, he was outstanding there. College gridiron showcase stood out, got a late call up to the Hula Bowl, stood out there as well against consistent FBS talent. Um, and defensive end edge rusher AJ Simon, I gotta mention, out of U Albany, he got the call to the Hula Bowl and performed well out there. You go watch his game against Hawaii, and he is out there killing that tackle, making life miserable for him. And he was a part of a very good Great Danes defensive front, but he was the pass rusher, and he's in his class. He's about six one and a half, six two, about two fifty. He can really go. He can really get after the quarterback. His Hula Bowl week was impressive against fbs power five tackle so those are guys that i will always stump the table for excellent tell the people how they can find your work again emory uh football game plan 900 prospects 900 scouting reports man and it's the largest draft guy in existence last year we had over a thousand this year we had 900 because a lot of guys went back to school um footballgameplan.com slash 2024 draft guide check it out it's the best draft guide it helps you pre-draft helps you when you have the undrafted free agents helps you during the preseason helps you during the season when guys pop up on the roster like well who the hell is this dude pretty sure i got a scout report on him and he'll be in the guy definitely well emily we really appreciate your time thank you for joining all dolphins.com all dolphins podcast yeah uh you can find our work at si.com nfl slash dolphins um and we will we appreciate you, Emery, and we'll be tuning in. We'll, we'll be coming back to you on uh, uh, as, as the draft approaches. So looking forward to that conversation. Thanks, appreciate Emery. You guys. Thank you guys for having me on.